I'm the first genetic engineer that Autodesk ever hired, and perhaps the last. But I really, uh, this is a candid shot of me at work. It's a little bit of everything. My laptop computer, glass of wine, cup of coffee. I try and keep things balanced. And a book on business strategy, because I have no idea how to do this type of stuff. But anyway, let me give you a little bit of background. T, Earl Grey Hot. To me, this is the pinnacle of manufacturing. And of course, I get it from Star Trek The Next Generation. Because the idea of having a matter assembler really, really works for me. This, I, this is how I would love to make everything in the world. Unfortunately, that's not how we do it. We make it through a lot of human effort in factories that seem to get larger and larger. Today, thankfully, we have robots, and this whole show is a testament to the robotic technologies that are coming online more and more. We've also got these little robots that are starting to allow us to make things, and this has really changed. I can, I can speak from from experience that this is changing the culture at places like Autodesk that makes design software because now everyone has essentially a little factory they can put on their desk. And of course, we're learning how to work at smaller and smaller scales as some of these robotic equipment and manufacturing systems allow us to print smaller and smaller things at sometimes very high precision. I've been tracking a lot of the 3D printing space, and it's really quite remarkable how small some of the microfabrication is getting today, even down to about 150 microns. This is, to give you an example, that's about five bacteria laid end to end. So molecular manufacturing in three dimensions is already starting to happen. But these are all really crude technologies. If you go out into the world and take a look at what's really good at manufacturing, where you see software, hardware everywhere, it's based on this unit. This is a eukaryotic cell. You and I are made up of about 38 trillion of these little critters, and these are some of the most sophisticated manufacturing plants on the planet. This is a peek at some of the gross circuit diagram of a, of a cell, not even a eukaryotic cell, and it can make thousands of different compounds, highly precise, robustly made in just the right proportions to make these little living creatures. These are highly robust information processors. They're aware of their environment, they're responsive to their environment, and running their metabolism, which is essentially information processing, and being able to create more of themselves. Our bodies are, in fact, networks of these little computing devices. And in fact, as we've gotten better at computing, we started to see biology through a new lens that evolved or engineered, they kind of have the same abstractions, the same architectures, single, single components that get to made into larger circuits, more sophisticated modules, ultimately free living computing devices, which we call cells, and then networks of those, tissues, organs, ultimately organisms. So what we're really starting to see now is a, is a meeting of the minds when it comes to life science and, and engineering. And the cool thing is, and this is the part I love, it comes with a programming language. Of course, today there's hundreds, if not thousands, of different programming languages in computing. There's one in DNA, and if you're really up to speed, maybe two, because they just rewrote the genetic code last week with a couple of new bases, X and Y. But this molecular programming language is really, really versatile. It's been, it's been stable for about four billion years. It allows you to reach in and program the metabolism of every living creature or component thereof. So I'm pretty much hooked on genetics. The cool thing about working with these little squishy manufacturing systems, 
with this digital programming language is it's all natural, it's non-toxic, unless you're making toxins. They can work with very raw materials. I mean base elements. They build bottom up. And they're infinitely recyclable. We've proven that by four billion years of kind of evolving these materials from stardust. Unfortunately, it was never very easy to do genetic engineering, to become a coder. This was a typical, is a typical laboratory. Walk into UCSF, walk into biotech companies. It's essentially a sophisticated kitchen. If you're not familiar with the tools, if you don't have the reagents, if you don't know how to cook, which takes PhD level skills, you're not going to be able to make very much. This is how I started, and I, frankly, I got tired of it. Today, this device is changing the world. This is a DNA synthesizer, an electroarray DNA synthesizer that uses these little chips, and you can make 12,000 strands of DNA on a single chip, and this particular device can load in eight chips. You can make massive amounts of DNA specific to the base pair on this machine that's about the size of a desktop printer. It's a pretty cool piece of equipment. This is essentially a 3D printer that works at the nanoscale, and there's nothing else like it in the world of molecular systems right now. And of course, O'Reilly's kind of figured out that something's happening in biology. They're, they're realizing that biology is a programming language, that these cells, these squishy little information systems, are kind of the ultimate cloud computing system already around the world, and they're seeing crossover between the programming community, the design community, the engineering community coming into life science now because it's being digitized. We're at the start of a revolution that will transform our lives as radically as the computer revolution, they say. And I believe they're right. And it will reach into everything we do in, our, in the world. That's why I joined Autodesk. Autodesk makes design software. They're not a life science company. They're not a biopharma. They, pre they do art and design and engineering. The tools are, allow some of the most sophisticated work, design work to be done relatively easily. And they make almost everything that's not alive in the world already. I joined them because I want to start engineering living things. I want to start being able to engineer things at the nanoscale, and we need a better tool set to do it. For the last two years, we've been working with scientists and our own in-house team on a project that we call Project Cyborg. Android was taken. But Project Cyborg is all about the fusing of non-living and living and building bridges to make something better. These are just a few screenshots, but you know, Autodesk is known for its, for its visualization, its simulation, its engineering capabilities, and we've been building what we think is a pretty good platform for people to start developing their tools on. Because right now, there's a lot of tools in the life science space, but most of them were made either as one-offs or part of a grad thesis, and really, there's not a lot of rationalization in it, and they're hard to use. We can make it easier. But what, even more than the tools, I'm not a coder anymore. I want to make sure that we can cook the software into printers, because the printers are ultimately the limiting factor. Now, 2D printers, you don't need to worry about. Lots of paper, I'm trying to get rid of those. 3D printers can already be used for a lot of life science applications. Rebuilding skulls, prosthetics, etc. The DNA printer is the newest tool that's probably one of the most powerful. And then there's the bioprinter that actually prints living cells. The company that I work with a lot is called Gen9. It uses that exact device to print a lot of DNA and assemble it into longer strings. It's a high-throughput DNA synthesis company. So this is kind of a shapeways for DNA. And now, with that with design tools and a company like Gen9, you can actually reach into the entire evolution of living species. And we're creating a new branch off that tree that we've called Synthetica.
These are all the synthetic organisms that we've made from scratch, as well as a few that we've tweaked and modified. This has been growing now for about 10 years. The first synthetic genome was made about 10 years ago. We're also learning how to build robust circuits. There's a whole community of researchers now that are taking inspiration from electronics, are learning how to build switches, signaling systems, and other controllers that are robust, powerful, reproducible. Some of the examples that are, you know, this is being applied to is things like a gene therapy that only turns on after you get the mutation, or gut microbes that respond if you, if you happen to eat a bad food, smart plants that can only turn on the genetic constructs when they're needed, for example, if there's a drought. So these are really interesting controllers that are widely applicable across the genetic engineering space. The particular work that I've been doing is on genetic engineering of viruses. Virus, this is a harmless virus. It's called Phyx174. It only infects E. coli, but it can be used as an antibiotic. It has a genome that's 5,386 bits, bits of information, and that's just become within reach of routine DNA synthesis. So today, you can become a genetic engineer really for relative, using the right tools at relatively low cost, but make something as powerful as a gene therapy or an antibiotic or a drug that hunts down cancer cells. But there's a lot more to this. On the very forward edge of this technology is a man named Craig Venter. Craig still holds the world record for the largest published genome, just over a million base pairs, over four years ago now, he booted up the first synthetic bacterium. He built a whole bacterial chromosome. A few weeks ago, this man, Jeff Boke and Buka, pardon me, and a team of international scientists that were all contributing to a project wrote the first chromosome of yeast, everyday baker's yeast that you buy at your local food store. So this is showing that not only have we progressed beyond just being able to build a bacterial chromosome, now we can build one as complex, really, as our own chromosomes. But now, even though it wasn't larger, we've shown that we can engineer it to the base pair to precision in a very complex structure, package it, and put it in a eukaryotic cell, a cell very like our own. And it works perfectly. That's pretty interesting. And I also know that it's going to make for some very, very interesting beers in the future because you can port just about any single compound from any other plant, animal, or bacteria to a yeast pretty easily. So, go Colorado. Anyway, there is also... But once you can engineer cells, you don't have to go and reverse engineer all of development. Remember, we start off as a single cell, end up at 38 trillion. That's a dance we're not going to be able to reverse engineer anytime soon. We're just not. It's too complex. But this is where the bioprinter comes in. This uses bioinks, which is a fancy way of saying cells. And it prints the cells in three dimensions and allow those cells grow together to make tissues. This company, Organovo, is at the forefront of the field. They're printing synthetic liver slices that are already being gobbled up by pharmaceutical companies to check for liver toxicity earlier and faster, not on animals, not on animal tissues, but on synthetic human tissues. This is really cool, and it can be done in a high-throughput format. So, but as the costs fall, you can start to play a little more. So some of the founders of Organova went on and created a company called Modern Meadow. Modern Meadow's job is to make leathers and synthetic meats, because now you don't have to sell to the high-end pharmaceutical companies. And in fact, Leathers and synthetic meats really touch the everyday consumer, well, pretty much all the time. My shoes are leather, and I'm going to eat a hamburger. And in fact, the first synthetic hamburger has already been made. Grabbed headlines for the cost of making it. It was really expensive. And the taste? Eh, not bad, the reviewers said. But there's a ways to go there. The thing is, if you can start to print cells, if you can start to move 
particular cells around, you can start to really imagine what you might create. Perhaps little flying robots like houseflies with carbon, you know, with carbon fiber skeletons and little chips. You know, things get weird. Or maybe your next pet. But the learning here is bidirectional. Yes, we're learning some of the secrets of living cells and how to manipulate them and how to program them. Remember, this isn't just big, giant companies. This, is, this can be very small groups today. And in fact, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, Y Combinator, typically known for software startups, has started to allow biotech companies to join their, their incubator because it really is starting to become another tool, another robot, another programming language. But some of the other things that we're actually learning is biology may actually end up powering most of your computing devices, not the next generation of chips, maybe not even the next generation after that, but certainly as they get down to the three or four nanometer scale, there is no process that we have in the world today that can manipulate matter that precisely to be able to chi build chips at that resolution. Our chips are literally going to have to be grown, and the semiconductor industry is starting to make the appropriate investments to understand and harness those processes for their, because they have to think 15 to 20 years out. There's also biomimicry, taking some of the really cool stuff that nature's already figured out, all of which is encapsulated in genomic code, like the gecko's foot, actually, you know, actually hydrogen bonding of you know, the, the very micro-fine hairs on a gecko's foot to be able to crawl up any surface. Now we're starting to be able to take inspiration from those systems, if not the actual code, and put them into different creatures, build different tools. And then there's generative design. Really, when you think about it, the reason why nature has been so successful is because it doesn't start off with a design concept. It just looks at the environment Any, anywhere there's an energetic niche, which is a really complicated problem. You're looking at predators, you're looking at energy sources, you're looking at waste streams, water, all sorts of different variables, temperature. Life solves those problems in every environment. And now we're learning how to do similar work inside of computers. You need to design a chair, a car, a business, create it generatively the computer will fill out the space with millions of designs, and then you write other programs that essentially act as the Grim Reaper, essentially filtering away you know, bad designs or designs that don't quite cut it in kind of a computational selection process. This is one of the most powerful new areas of design because it's unbiased. It leads to some really elegant new creations and they meet all the constraints of the manufacturing process, the financiers, as many constraints as you can imagine at the start of the design process. So where does this take us? Well, it's going to make for smarter cities and smarter materials because we're going to add three billion people to this planet by 2050 and we can't just keep paving over everything to do it. We have to start making living systems that actually meet the needs of humanity or we're going to run into trouble. That's why I love bioengineering and biosynthesis. It's also going to help us get off this rock and explore other places. And I'm not talking big, giant spacecraft or going and colonizing other galaxies. I'm just saying if you want people to live up in a spacecraft for a year, you have to think about how you recycle, how you synthesize, how you make food, how you clean up waste. Space has been such a good system for learning about ecosystems and sustainability. You know, really things, lessons that we can learn for our entire planet. Maybe it'll even re-sculpt us. Because some people like this fellow here, Dmitry Itzkov, really believes that we're going to be making cyborgs sooner than we cure most diseases. And you know what? Given the rate of robot evolution, he may be right. I just know this. You know, really, the future is going to be grown. Yes, we'll keep manufacturing. Yes, we'll do it smarter. We'll do it more efficiently. But more and more things that to meet humanity's needs will come from biocoding and growing our needs. Thank you very much.